Chapter 1 Valentine I smiled down at the new Mr. and Mrs. Claus, a sense of satisfaction rolling over me at seeing the newly married couple laughing and enjoying their reception party. I'd had a hand in getting J.D. and Nick together, though not in the traditional sense. There had been no shooting of arrows or the forcing of two people together who didn't know they were perfect for each other. No. With J.D. and Nick, it had been inspired by a favor for a friend. My best friend Amory knew Nick through the fairy tale world and made mention to me of how lonely he'd become since his parents had died. I'd looked through the love lexicon and found there was a lonely witch with a heart of gold in Salem and decided to nudge the two together. It had been a little bit of a long game plan though. Getting Tony and Mary to stumble upon the North Pole, only to meet Nick in the flesh. Then I had to pick my moment, whispering into Mary's ear that she should give JD the card from Santa at the opportune time. There were so many moving pieces to their romantic puzzle, but once they were together, the magic happened just the way it should. There wasn't anything better than a faded, passionate, and all-consuming love. And Nick and JD had it in spades, and together they would soon bring a precious little child into the world, one who would grow in its beautiful light. I took one final look at their happy faces, then took flight, flying away from the reception and toward the sky. We angels lived in the clouds, or more accurately, through a magical veil and beyond in another realm that was accessed directly via the clouds. I headed straight for one of the celestial doors, flying through and into our designated area. Love angels were considered less than by the strong and fearsome warrior angels as well as by the fleet-winged messenger angels, but I couldn't care less. We had so much more freedom than any of the other ranks of angels. We were always flying back and forth to earth and our whole existences were focused upon uniting souls who would be in love forever. What better job was there? I felt blessed to be what I was, truthfully. Tucking in my wings at my back once more, I walked down the familiar corridor and into the main common area. Amory was standing by the water fountain with a friend of ours, Tyrone. My immediate reaction was one that we frowned upon as angels of love. Anger and jealousy, emotions unbecoming of our rank. Tyrone was a good-looking man and a lot of the other angels, male and female alike, had been with him at one point or another. Not Amory, not yet anyway. I lifted my hand and waved at them as they both glanced my way. Amory's whole face lit up with a smile that beckoned to me. She was wearing her long blonde hair straight today, which made her look sophisticated, an altogether different girl from the one I'd grown up with. Hey, I greeted them both, stepping into their circle. Hey back, Amory said, grabbing my hand and squeezing. How was the wedding? I'm so sorry I missed it. It was lovely, I managed to reply, my skin aching from where she was touching me. You should contact Nikki when things slow down and see if you two can catch up. You'll love JD. She's a real spitfire. Tyrone ignored me completely and changed the subject. So, what are your assignments like this week, Amory? Amory let go of my hand, and with an apologetic smile picked up her conversation with Tyrone once more. I listened to them chatting about work for a while, but I was itching to get away. I'm just going to grab something to eat, then head back to my room, I announced when there was a natural lull in their conversation. Oh okay, Amory said, no longer beaming, her radiance somehow dimmer. We'll catch up later then. Absolutely, I agreed, then took my leave. Angels had rules about fraternizing with each other, and with humans if I was being specific. We weren't meant to be intimate with either. But if the need for physical contact became too much and we succumbed, then that was all it was meant to be. A fleeting desire to meet our needs, then it was back to work. Love and relationships were not on the cards for angels, not even we cupids. But that didn't stop me from loving my best friend. In fact, I'd been in love with her for as long as I could remember. But until the heavenly laws of our realm changed, I was stuck with cold showers to suppress the fire burning within me, and even colder nights alone in my bed. I lay on my bed reading for a few hours before the dinner bell chimed throughout our living quarters. I rolled to my feet, shaking my head at the sound. In some ways, I often felt like a human college student. Doing nothing but studying and working, 
than eating to a schedule designed by those not doing our job. There was a knock at my door just as I went to open it. Yes? I called out, my arm extended towards the handle. It's me, Amory said cheerfully. Can I come in? A wave of longing passed over me as I forced a smile onto my face. Of course. She pushed open the door without a second's hesitation. I jumped back instinctively to avoid the swing. Oh sorry. She giggled, turning away to shut the door behind her. I didn't think you'd be right there. I coughed to clear my throat, then leaned back against my desk, arms crossed over my chest. I was just heading out for dinner. Amory flounced over to my double bed, then threw herself down on the mattress as though she owned the place. Can we talk for a sec first? My head was already nodding, but inside my mind I was screaming, no. Of course. Damn, she has beautiful legs. What do you think about Tyrone? She asked, drawing herself up to sit on my bed, her legs crossed and her shoulders rounded in a relaxed posture. From her position seated on my bed, with me standing against the opposite wall, I now had the best view of her cleavage I'd ever seen. I'll be damned if she doesn't have the most perfect breasts. What about him? I asked casually, uncrossing my arms and shifting my position so I was sitting on my desk chair at a similar height to my friend. Amory rolled her eyes. You know what I mean. He's so sexy, everyone wants him. I snorted. Everyone's had him. Not me, Amory said quietly, then dropped her gaze to her hands folded in her lap. Not yet anyway. Oh no, Amory. Not him. The words were out of my mouth before I could think better of them. Her head came up, her eyes wide with surprise. What do you mean? I heaved in a breath as I tried to gain control over my feelings, but anger laced my words when I responded. You've never been with any angel, why waste your precious purity on him? She blinked at me as though taken aback by my words. Because he's? When she paused, I filled in the gap with my rising fury. He's what? Arrogant. Sinful. Charming. Perfect for a one-night roll in the hay. Is that what you want? My fury consumed me, and I felt so bitterly disappointed in her I could scarcely breathe. How stupid could she be? I'd always loved Amory. First as a fellow Cupid, then as my best friend, then as so much more. To think that she would lower herself to the most basic of all human emotions, lust. I was beyond angry, and judging by the look on Amory's face, I wasn't the only one. She got gracefully to her feet, her hazel eyes flashing gold lightning at me. Who do you think you are, talking to me like that? Your best friend. I defended. Someone who knows you better than anyone else. And I can tell you, if you follow through with this, you're going to regret it. What sort of friend are you to judge me like this? She threw her hands up in the air. I've never been with anyone before Val, and you know that. Which was a huge part of the reason that I'd been able to keep my feelings for her hidden for so long. Of course I know that. I just said as much. I yelled back at her. So, why throw that away on an angel who's fucked half this unit and most of the others? Amory moved fast and slapped me hard. My head snapped sideways as my cheek pulsed with pain. I slowly turned my face back to look at her, my own eyes blazing. Don't you ever speak to me again, she hissed, then she left my room. My cheek continued to sting for some time after her emotional blow, and my stomach growled still starving. I took a deep breath and walked out the open door towards the kitchen hall. Amory was right, she could do whatever she liked. It wasn't up to me to tell her what was right and wrong. She was a big girl. But if she ended up with that big douchebag, I wasn't going to be accountable for my actions. Chapter 2 Amory That fucking asshole. I stomped indignantly through the hallways of heaven, madder than I'd been in centuries. I'd gone past my turn off, too angry to sit with all the other cupids, so I kept marching. I was almost at the other end of the corridor and speeding towards the dinner hall at the far end of angel accommodations. 
It would mean I'd have to eat with the messenger angels tonight, but at this point, I didn't care where I was, as long as I was as far away from Valentine as possible. I ran into a warrior angel as I rounded a corner, bouncing off his huge chest. Sorry. I yelled after him, not stopping to check if he was okay. I'd hit him pretty hard, but my body was numb to any sort of pain at the moment. How dare Val say such a thing to me? I'd gone to him with my question, because I trusted him. Because I thought he'd give me the right advice, maybe even empathize with me. But no. He practically called me a wing-ho, comparing me to everyone else. When I got to the furthest dining room, I glanced around at all the black and brown outfits clinging to the tall, lanky angels. There wasn't a cupid in sight, and I was so filled with rage I was glad of it. I walked straight over to the banquet table, grabbed a plate and filled it with sugary treats. They only had one section for desserts, which was odd to me. Cupids only ate sugar. Our entire banquet was a dentist's worst nightmare. When I finally had enough food piled on my plate, I whirled around and surveyed the area. Lots of the messenger angels were looking at me, but with curiosity more than friendliness. In the end, I just chose the table closest to me and sat down with four male messenger angels, all of whom stared at me like I was a dream. Hey, I said, nodding at them as I pulled in my chair. I won't stay long, I promise. I put my head down and got to eating. Their crepes and chocolate sauce weren't nearly as sweet as I'd normally like, but they were heavy and nutrient-rich, and my stomach gurgled with happiness in response. It would do for tonight. The four angels around me were so quiet, I eventually peeked to look up at them. They were all still staring at me, speaking. What? I asked, still tetchy. The guy closest to me, who had lovely brown curly hair, gave me an awkward smile. We, ah, you're very beautiful. I shrugged. I'm a Cupid. It kind of comes with the territory. It wasn't really a compliment that they thought I was pretty. I had long blonde hair and a body that most men thought was attractive. But it wasn't my choice. I had no say in the matter. It was just lucky genetics and celestial chemistry. So, what brings you here? The messenger opposite me asked, still eating and seemingly curious, but in a friendly manner. He wasn't staring at me with lust the way the others were. I stuffed a fluffy pink marshmallow puff into my mouth and chomped on it, my gaze dropping to their plates. They all had the same fare, meat and bread with a few roasted vegetables. Not for me. I considered my options, and in the end couldn't come up with a good enough excuse, so I settled on telling them the truth. I had a fight with my best friend and got so mad that I smacked him in the jaw and came down here for dinner. I didn't want to look at his smug face for the rest of the night or deal with all the other cupids being nosy. The men around me chuckled. What did he do? The friendly one asked. I frowned. How was I supposed to explain it without sounding like I was easy? I was thinking about perhaps dating one of the other cupids, and my friend lost his freaking mind. The guys glanced at each other, some in spoken understanding passing between them. You're allowed to date? The curly-haired messenger next to me asked. I rolled my eyes. No. But you know what I mean. The guy opposite me, whose aura I found soothing, nodded. Yeah, we do. So let me get this straight. You have a male best friend, and when you showed interest in another Cupid, your friend got insanely jealous? No. He. I trailed off. All the guys around me waited patiently with amusement as the penny dropped. I narrowed my hazel eyes at the guy opposite me. You think he was jealous? Seriously? No. That's impossible. We're just friends. And besides, I flicked my hair over my shoulder, my face growing hot, we're cupids. We don't get jealous. Three of the angels burst out laughing. But not the calm one. He just gave me a cute smile. Listen, Blondie. Amory. Amory, he repeated, then pointed his thumb at himself. I'm Blake. Listen, Amory, cupid or no cupid, us guys are still made of the same stuff all men in the universe are made of. And I hate to break it to you, but anger and jealousy are part of that. 
but we've always just been best friends. I managed to mumble, though even to my own ears, my reasoning was starting to sound more and more feeble. He's never said anything before. I tore open a sugary jam donut, scooped some of the strawberry jam onto my finger, and sucked it off with a satisfied sigh, licking my lips afterwards. Curly locks next to me groaned aloud. Please don't do that. I frowned at him, not sure of what I did to upset him. Ha! Huh. All the other guys at the table shoved at their plates, stood up, and walked away, leaving their meals unfinished. I was left alone with Blake, who was just shaking his head and dipping his bread into the gravy. What did I do? I asked confused. Blake finally cracked a smile. You mean other than making them all randy as hell? But I was just eating, I explained, stupefied. It's how we all eat. Cupids, I mean. Well, we don't. As you can see. Blake gestured to the half-eaten meals of roast vegetables, cut meat, and warm toasty rolls. And our women certainly don't eat like you either. It would prove distracting to most. I glanced around the room at the strong women seated at the other tables. They ate the same food as the men, their hands clasping silver knives and forks, as they ate gracefully. I reached for a napkin, to wipe the crinkly white flakes of sugar from my fingertips and grimaced. I'm sorry. Blake grunted. Don't apologize. You are what you are and have your own ways. It's probably why you cupids stay up your end so much. Our guys would be jumping your bones on the regular if you didn't. I tilted my head at him, my curiosity aroused. He wasn't looking at me the same way the other guys had. But not you. Blake reached for his cup and took a sip of whatever was in it. Then he met my gaze with a rueful smile. Sorry, Blondie. I'd probably be into your friend, though. What's his name again? I didn't say. Oh. Right. I grinned at him as understanding dawned on me and relaxed against the back of my chair. Well, maybe you can help me since you obviously know men better than I do. What am I meant to do now? Having given my anger time to cool, I was feeling sad. I didn't want Val to hate me. I relied on his stoic strength and loyal friendship. He was the angel I trusted most in the whole world. Are the rules the same for you cupids as with us? Blake asked suddenly, interrupting my musings. You're not allowed relationships except for fleeting ones? I nodded my head. Yeah, ironically, we're not allowed to fall in love, basically. We can spend a night or two together to blow off some steam, but that's it. Those that break the rules tend to disappear. I'd sometimes wondered what the authorities of heaven did with those cupids, but as we had no answers, I tried not to dwell on the questions. Blake grabbed his own linen napkin and wiped his mouth. A lot of the messengers are in relationships, long-term ones too. Decades even sometimes. Considering we're basically immortal, it seems stupid to stop us, don't you think? Decades? My jaw dropped and I gaped at him in shock. How come you guys are able to get away with it then? He shrugged. Maybe because we aren't angels of love. Maybe your magic is based around your selflessness? No idea, honestly. I couldn't say it with any certainty. I groaned. Great. Now I'm totally stuck. No. You're just at the beginning, Blondie. Blake pushed his plate away. You need to work out how you feel about your friend and how he feels about you. Then you can go from there. But he's just my friend, I explained. I thought that was obvious. My best friend. He was the guy I'd loved since I even knew what love was. An angel I would die for if it came to it. But we'd always been so close growing up, I'd never imagine we could be anything more than friends. We were just us. Val and Amory. At least I'd thought that's how it was. Blake grinned at me. Us guys don't get that jealous over nothing. So go figure out what's going on, then come back for another chat sometime. We'll work out what you should do next. Blake stood up and scratched his neck. I rounded the table in a heartbeat and hugged him tightly. Thanks, Blake. And I meant it. This random, fellow angel had given me some sense of hope and control over the confronting situation in which I found myself.
He chuckled and patted me on the back. All good, Blondie. You best go back to your side of the clouds before people start talking about us. I stared up into his dark eyes and smiled at him. Okay. I was tempted to kiss him, just to rile up the other angels I could feel blatantly staring at us, but poor Blake already looked done enough and looked a tad uncomfortable already. See you soon then, I said before I flounced off down the hall again, with a renewed sense of purpose and his sage words of advice still ringing in my ears. My anger was gone, but I had a mission now, to find out if the messenger angels were right. Did Val really harbor feelings for me past those of a platonic nature? And if he did, what in heaven's name was I going to do about it? And how the hell do I feel? Chapter 3 Valentine I went to get my new assignments from our supervisor, then headed straight to bed after dinner, bolting the door. Amory hadn't come to the dining room at all, which meant she'd either skipped dinner or had gone to eat at one of the other halls, which would have been most unusual. Different creeds of angels didn't normally make a habit of mixing. We generally kept to our own. But damn had she been angry when she'd left my room. Madder than I'd ever seen her in fact. I'd really touched a nerve. Does she really want Tyrone that badly? I wondered, feeling sick to my stomach. When I lay in bed that night, my body burned for her, as it had done for centuries. Amory and I were both over 300 earth years old. We'd been born into the light at a similar time, within just a few years of each other. We'd grown up together, been assigned the same areas, and had been fast friends for all that time. But I'd always loved her, and had felt safe in the knowledge that she could never love another. We weren't allowed to have romantic, lasting relationships, so even though Amory was never necessarily able to love me, I'd assumed she wouldn't fall for anyone else either. We'd been there for each other, together, always. Until now. Watching her toy with the idea of falling into Tyrone's bed had been the dynamite stick I'd needed to get off my laurels. There was no waiting and watching anymore. There was no longer any security in the fact we were cupids and not allowed relationships. She could end up in every cupid's bed if I didn't say something. My hands tightened into fists and my teeth clenched within my jaw at the very idea of all those men touching my girl. Avery was my angel, the winged woman that I loved. Even if she was only with Tyrone for a single night, I didn't want that for her. And I certainly didn't think he deserved her. To look upon Amory's flawless beauty and touch her in a way that no man or angel had ever had the privilege of doing. No. It can't happen. I won't let it. She deserves more. She deserves love. I slept terribly that night and crept out of my room at daybreak, hoping to miss out on seeing the other angels. But I wasn't so lucky. The first two beings I happened upon were Amory and Tyrone, lying on the lounges in the common area, sipping from mugs and laughing away like they didn't have a care in the world. The sound of their happiness hit me in the chest with the weight of a hundred-pound anvil. Val? Amory called out, gesturing with her hands that I should join them. Come sit with us. I didn't want to. Damn, I so didn't want to. But when Amory smiled at me like that, I couldn't resist. I didn't have the heart to say no to her. I tucked my to-do list under my arm and made my way into the common area, which apart from the two angels I didn't want to see was entirely empty. Morning. I managed to say, my gaze skating casually over their bodies. Had they been together last night? Did Amory look different somehow? They were both still in their nightclothes, long white pajamas with low necklines and slits in their pants. Amory was lying on her back with one arm raised on a pillow. She looked gorgeous. And sated. I was going to be sick. I need to go. I said, turning and walking away as fast as my legs would take me. I almost got to the portal door when Amory caught up with me. Hey. Val. Stop. No way. I wasn't going to stop, and I certainly wasn't looking back. I grabbed the door and threw it open, but her hand tugged me back, her grip on my shirt sleeve too tight to fight. Val? I said stop. What's the matter with you? 
I whirled around to glare at her, and couldn't stop my hungry gaze from soaking in her face. Her eyes had always been a lovely hazel, but as she'd matured her irises had developed gorgeous flecks of gold within them. Her cheeks were even rosy this morning, and her skin was clear and creamy. She truly was a perfect Cupid. Did you sleep with him? I demanded, not even trying to hide my jealousy. I could barely breathe, and was huffing like an unfit old man trying to run a marathon. Amory blinked at me, shock written all over her face before that cleared and made way for curiosity. Fuck. Why, she asked, crossing her arms over her chest but under her breasts, making the nipples peak and push against the soft material of her top. Why what? I managed to respond, dragging my gaze back up to her face. Why do you want to know if I slept with Tyrone? How is it any of your business? I took a step away from her, ready to dive straight through the portal and into the human world. There would be relief from my feelings there. I would be focused on someone else's pain and worry. Not my own. Don't you dare, Amory said, her gaze narrowing like an archer ready to shoot. Dare what? I asked, inches away from the door now. She raced forward and thrust her arm over the opening, which in turn put her body right up against mine. Don't you dare go flying off into the human realm before we finish this discussion. Now, I couldn't breathe for an entirely new reason. Amory's breasts were pressed against my arm, and her thigh brushed the outside of mine. I could feel her breath so close and her lips, with more willpower than I thought I possessed I took a big step back and away from her. What do you want, Amory? To rub it in my face that you finally got rid of your virtue like it was trash. Wonderful. Congratulations. Her jaw dropped, then her eyes narrowed even further as she stepped away from the door. You sound like such a pompous asshole, you know that? I'm not a bride or a virgin, so you don't get to lecture me about purity. You're not a virgin. I whispered, the shock at her admission smashing over me like a tidal wave and robbing me of my breath. She rolled her eyes with a groan. You know that's not what I meant. I've never been with anyone, but virginity is a human concept, Valentine. We're angels. And Cupid's at that. Our destiny is to find love for others, not for ourselves. Every word felt a kick to my gut with a steel cap boot. I'd always known that Amory didn't feel about me what I felt for her. But I'd been able to ignore that painful truth until now. So, you haven't been with Tyrone? I whispered, not giving a damn about how pathetic I sounded. I needed to know. She stared at me for a long while, a pregnant pause filling the space between us. No, she finally said. My shoulders sagged as relief soothed my jagged nerves. Good. Her lips pressed into a thin line, then she fidgeted, grabbing a hair clip from her pocket before thrusting her long hair up into a messy bun on the top of her head. She was about to start talking again, and I wasn't sure I was up to it. I'm going to go, Amory. But we haven't finished talking, she objected, her brows furrowed. We have for now. I moved to step away. Once again, my best friend tried to get in my way. But I didn't let her, not this time. I pushed her arm up and ducked underneath. Then I jumped, diving through the portal and into the clouds, leaving behind the stress of my love for Amory. She was likely storming her way through the clouds or telling Tyrone what an asshole I was, but I couldn't focus on that. It was time for work, time to get my head in the game. My assignment for today was to shoot a love arrow into a man in Texas, USA. He was stubborn and rowdy, but a hard worker who loved his family. His wife had passed, leaving him with two young ones. The owner of the diner near his house was in love with him, and the love lexicon said they would be a good match, not just for each other, but as the parents for the children left behind. It was my job to make sure the stubborn man finally saw what was right in front of him. The irony of the situation wasn't lost on me, but I couldn't focus on my own feelings, not today. Today was about Robert and Judy. I flew down into the hot blazing sun of a Texas summer. No one could see me unless I willed it, which was nice, because it meant I saw everything. No one's actions were hidden from me. No one censored themselves when they didn't know they were being watched. Robert hopped out of his pickup, 
then moved to the back door to get his children out. Two little girls with ginger freckles and curls slid down. They were mirror images of the mama they'd lost. The doting father scooped the girls up into his arms and carried them into the diner, the whole little family awash with love and laughter. And when the door to the cafe opened, I could smell it in the air. True love. Judy stood behind the counter, marking something into her ledger. When she looked up, she only had eyes for the man walking into the room. Robert set his girls down, then ran a tentative hand through his dark hair. Hiya, Judy. Well, howdy there, Judy said, walking around the countertop and swinging her hips in time with the music playing on the radio. Are y'all here for lunch? The girls nodded, shy of the beautiful woman destined to become their new mama. Well, come on then, she said, offering a hand to the oldest girl. Sarah, who was barely four, took Judy's hand, then grabbed hold of her two-year-old sister's hand. Come on, Millie. And together they wove their way through the diner and into the back booths where the girls would be most comfortable. I magicked up my crossbow and pulled an arrow from the quiver on my back. This was it. The moment where I had the chance to change these people's lives forever. Robert was staring at the way his girls were interacting with Judy, his heart aching with the need for love. For a wife. For a mother for his children. But he was also filled with grief, worry, and guilt. Feelings he didn't deserve to carry, nor served him after more than a year of dutifully mourning his lost wife. I set the arrow into the knock and pulled back my bow. Robert took one more hesitant step forward. I launched a Cupid's arrow straight at him. It struck him in the dead center of his muscular back. He stumbled forward a moment, catching himself on a table, as the potent love spread through every muscle and fiber in his body. Using my magic, I transported myself to the other end of the diner so I could watch Robert's face change. His eyes began to shine with hope for the first time in a long time, and his whole body relaxed as though the weight of the world had been lifted from his shoulders. He straightened up and resumed his walk over to Judy. She reached for him in her friendly, intimate manner to ask how he was. Robert didn't flinch at her touch, but instead lay a hand on Judy's waist and gave her a smile that made her weak at the knees. My heart soared as I took one final look at the couple that were made to be together, then used my magic to flash myself to the closest empty park where I could sit and enjoy the sunshine. A job well done. I lay back on a park bench and stretched out my wings, staring up the clouds. Home. But for the first time in a long while, I didn't look forward to returning. Maybe there was a way I could stay with the humans forever? I closed my eyes and sighed. There was only one way for an angel to join humanity. They had to fall. They made the choice to give up their immortality and become human forever, far from the beauty and light of heaven. And that was a choice I was never going to make. I had far more to lose than I would ever gain in flying away from my troubles and pain. And I had a sacred calling, a duty to uphold. I was an angel of love, and I couldn't turn my back on what I was born to be. Chapter 4 Amory I didn't follow Val to Earth after he literally dove through the clouds to get away from me. Instead, I spent the rest of the day in my room, reading and thinking, and just trying to wrap my head around the whole situation. If the messenger Angel Blake was correct, and Val really was jealous about the idea of me spending a single night in Tyrone's bed, what did that actually mean? Did he want me for himself? He'd never mentioned anything about it before. I certainly knew of other friends who shared their beds when the moment struck. Was that something we could incorporate into our friendship also? Val and I? It would make sense. I truly trusted him more than anyone. I loved him completely. Not to mention the fact that I thought he was beautiful. That tan skin and those gorgeous blue eyes with his incredible contrasting snow white hair. He was different to the other cupids, less pretty. More. I didn't even have a word for it. Handsome. He was ruggedly handsome. But an actual romantic relationship was impossible between us. It wasn't allowed with cupids, even if my new friend Blake seemed to think it was more accepted amongst the other angelic ranks. 
When I went to dinner that night, I was surprised to find three of the four messenger angels in our dining hall. I walked straight over to them, where they sat at a table with their plates piled high with bread. We didn't really have any savory options in our buffet. What's wrong, boys? I asked, grinning at Blake as he stared up at me. Run out of carbohydrates down your end? Blake returned my smile. We just thought we'd return the favor and grace you with our presence. I laughed with unexpected delight and took a step toward the overflowing sweet banquet tables. I'll just get some dinner, then join you. By the time I returned, the other two messenger angels had moved to the opposite side of the table, leaving a spot next to Blake for me. I didn't hesitate, sliding down onto the chair next to my new friend. So, how was your day? I asked with a smile. Curly Locks waved his hand at me. Let's skip the small talk. Tell me more about the cupids. Which ones are available? I chuckled, shaking my head in good humor, and reached for my hot chocolate, filled to the brim with pink and white marshmallows. They all are, I said after a sip. We don't pair up, remember? Not allowed and all that. Curly Locks's gaze raced straight back to me. So, I could invite any of these gorgeous girls into my bed? I snorted. I don't know. Can you? The guys jumped up together and with a pair of smug grins, stalked off to talk to some of my beautiful friends. I just watched them go, shaking my head again at their bravado as they walked. They don't know what they're getting themselves into. It was Blake's turn to chuckle. And why's that? I shrugged my shoulders. I've been told that once you're with a Cupid, there's no going back. I suppose that's why our rules are so strict. I watched Curly Locks charming a Cupid called Amel. Think I should warn him? Nah. Don't bother, Blake said, tearing into his bread roll. His ego needs a little deflating anyway. I reached for a Danish pastry, licking my lips at the sight of the juicy peach slices between each buttery crisp layer. My favorite. So why are you really here, Blake? He turned his huge shoulders a little so he could look at me more easily. I wanted to check in on you. You know, see how you're going with the best friend situation. I groaned and pushed away my plate, my appetite evaporating in an instant. Damn it. It's not good. Why, he asked, elbowing me in the side. What's happened? I shrugged and sighed. Nothing in particular. It's just, he's so angry at me, and I haven't even done anything yet. Blake snorted. You showed interest in sharing another guy's bed. If this Cupid. Val. I filled in his name so Blake would stop referring to him as the friend. Okay, well if Val is into you, and it sounds like he is. Then he's jealous, and rightly so. So, what do I do? I asked. Blake slathered his bread with some butter and raspberry jam and took a big bite. Confront him. Or you know, make him so jealous he confronts you. Either way will work. Val entered the dining room and I instantly felt it. My gaze found him and my heart stopped. He looked around the room, his striking blue eyes finding me, then hardening. His gaze shot over to Blake, who was sitting at my side, casually eating his bread. A gasp caught in my throat as he started marching towards us. He's them here. I whispered at Blake. That's him. Blake kept eating, reaching for another slab of butter. The one who looks like a charging bull. Did I accidentally wear red today? He joked quietly. I reached for my hot chocolate to stifle my laughter. Yep. Blake leaned close and whispered into my ear, Just follow my lead, okay, blondie? Follow his lead. What on earth does he mean by that? Hey Val, I said, swallowing the lump in my throat that was clogging up rapidly. How was your day? Turbulent by the looks of things. Who's this? Val nodded at Blake without answering my question. I frowned at him. That's not very nice. Val didn't flinch but raised an eyebrow in question. I sighed heavily. He really was angry at me for what I'd said about Tyrone. And it wasn't as though I'd said I would jump into bed with him, I'd just been flattered by the attention more than anything. I gestured to my new friend. This is Blake. 
Blake stood up and extended his arm in greeting like this was any other normal day or moment. Hey, he offered calmly. Val looked down his nose at the huge messenger angel as though he was a bug to squash and not a big muscled man. You're in the wrong dining hall. Blake sat back down next to me, but this time he draped his arm over my shoulders, pulling me in tightly against his body. No. I don't think I am, mate. I shivered, more from the shock of the closeness than anything else. Blake was big and warm but smelled different. I wasn't aroused, though my cheeks immediately warmed. Amory. Val's gaze pinned me down. What is going on here? Have you told every angel in heaven that you're open for business? My breath hissed in my throat and I exploded. What the fuck did you just say to me? Val's eyes widened, as though he'd finally realized that he'd stepped out of bounds. You. Me what? I asked, standing up and glaring at Val across the table. Who do you think you are, Val? My keeper. God. No. I just. He stopped. I waited. Until I couldn't wait anymore. My stomach literally hurt from keeping all my feelings bottled up. You just what? I demanded. Think you have the right to tell me who I can share my bed with? We're angels, Val. Immortals. You think I should stay celibate the rest of my days because you do? Well, fuck you and your rules. Blake chuckled and tugged me down, so I was sitting in his lap. Don't get all hot under the collar, love, he soothed. If this guy doesn't want you to share his bed, you know I do. Blake's hands rested on my thighs. I slid an arm awkwardly around his big beefy shoulders. Again, his smell wasn't quite right and did nothing for me, not to mention I knew he was otherwise inclined. Val didn't seem to notice my subtle discomfort at all. His nostrils flared with anger, then he marched away without any dinner. I slid off Blake's lap and put my hands to my flaming hot cheeks. Oh my god. I'm so embarrassed. Blake laughed. You? Do you know how hard that was for me to pull off? You smell completely wrong. My jaw dropped as I stared up at him. Oh my, seriously? I was thinking the exact same thing about you. But why is that? It's because I only like men, Blake said, as though that explained everything. Okay, I managed to respond, then slumped in my chair. Now what? Now. I'd love to go over to that table and pick up the little red head, but I have the feeling he's not gonna listen to me after that little show we just put on. I glanced over to the table he was talking about, my gaze immediately going to Shonail. The red-haired woman who was flashing jealous daggers at me. Not her, Blake groaned from beside me. Him. The one with the green eyes. I started to giggle when I realized who he was actually talking about. Oh. That's Tony. He'll love you. You should go talk to him. Blake shook his head. Not tonight, Blondie. We've got to keep up this ruse until Val decides to pull his head out his ass. Sorry what? Pulls his head out of where? These messenger angels were so different to us. Not only in their uniform and size, but the way they spoke, and even their relationships. I hadn't realized before how much variance there was between us, until now. Blake stood up and straightened his shirt, his bulky biceps popping as he did so. Don't worry about it. Just play along. Say we're dating and you're considering sleeping with me. I give Val exactly one human day before he breaks and comes begging you to have him instead of me. I bit my lip until the pain made me stop. Ah, but I don't know if that's actually what I want. Blake bent down and kissed me on the cheek in a slow, deliberate caress. Then you better work it out and fast, because he's coming for you. I guarantee it. Blake shucked my chin with his fist gently, then headed back to his end of the angel living quarters without a backward glance. Every cupid in the room stared at me like I'd just morphed into a bloody unicorn. So, I grabbed an extra cupcake and headed to my bedroom to hide from the world. I wasn't sure where Val had gone, but he didn't come looking for me that night. I would know, because I barely got a moment's sleep. Chapter 5 Valentine 
I didn't go back to my room. I went back to the portal and dove to earth once again, seeking solace in the one place I felt in control of my emotions. Maybe the only one. When I landed, I found a place to rest, and even though it was nighttime and so dark that I could barely see what was around me, I felt at peace. So I lay in a meadow in Arkansas, listening to the night animals as they scratched, purred and howled, and I was happy. A light flashed in the darkness, and I sat up. There was a woman walking towards me, with a lantern raised in her hand. I didn't bother moving, being that she shouldn't be able to see me, anyway. Humans couldn't, and from what I could tell, she was a human woman. Hello there, she said, stepping right up to me, then sitting down in the grass beside me. I stared at her beautiful face, unsure and totally confused. I'm sorry, are you talking to me? The young woman laughed, throwing her head back so her long blonde hair shook in a rainbow of light behind her. I'm Abigail, but you can call me Abby for short. Ah. Valentine, I offered. Val for short. Abby looked to be about 25 years old, with pale skin and lovely light blue eyes. She wore a casual gray sweater and a faded pair of jeans, like she lived around here. I forget that most people can't see angels, she responded smiling as she dusted the dirt from her hands. I got a call that you'd been spotted, so I came to check if you needed any help. It shouldn't have been possible, but the more she talked, the more confused I felt. I'd thought that with more information I'd find myself out of the swamp, but that wasn't the case at all. I'm sorry, Abby. But who saw me? And who called you? And why? I felt like a simpleton, but was sure things would click into gear soon enough. Shall we go somewhere else to talk, she asked. It's pretty dark out here, and there's an all-night diner about a mile from here. Do you want to just zap us there? She held out her hand to me, like traveling with an angel was an everyday event for her. She had my curiosity piqued, that was for sure. Oh. Now I definitely need to find out who you are. I clasped her hand in mine, searched for the diner she spoke of with my mind, then zapped us both there in the blink of a human eye. We were now both seated at a booth in the diner, near the door. I chose to make myself visible to the diner's patrons, appearing human, with my wings tucked away so that they were invisible to their mortal eyes. The waitress looked up. Be there in a minute, she called out. Abby shivered suddenly. That's much better. It was getting cold out in that field. The waitress came over with a pen, paper, and a sour expression on her face. What can I get you? Pancakes, extra ice cream, and a chocolate milkshake please, Abby said. I nodded at her. Nicely done. All cupids were addicted to sugar. I'll have the same please. The waitress headed off and I stared at Abby, trying to read her aura. You don't look like a Cupid. I began. She cackled out a laugh that sounded more like a naughty child than anything else. Oh I'm human, don't worry. I wasn't worried, but... You've never met anyone like me before. I get it. It's okay Val. Our milkshakes arrived, and Abby immediately tucked into hers. I just stared at the beautiful young woman. Maybe she was a fairy or a witch in disguise. I couldn't get an accurate read on her. Abby flicked her gaze up to mine. I'm human like I said. Stop trying to read me. How on earth had she read my mind like that? Now, you have to tell me everything. Start talking Abby. Abby sat back against the booth and grinned. Okay. I've left you in suspense long enough. Our stacks of deliciously warm pancakes arrived with loads of ice cream and syrup to boot. I grabbed the little pouring jug and started eating. Please continue. Well, in short, I'm an angel earth agent, which means, before you ask that I help any angel that decides they want to stay on earth and live a human life. And there's a lot more than you'd think. My jaw dropped. You? I'm sorry what? She picked up her knife and fork and started cutting up her pancakes. It's in my family line. My parents, my cousins, all of us. We're all human and mortal, but we can hear you and see you. My whole world blew apart at the seams in under a minute, and I didn't know where to even start with my questions. So you. 
Okay. I'm going to need more information. She chewed her pancakes, then took another sip of her frothy chocolate milkshake. I know they don't tell you guys this, but some angels choose to fall. They want to live down here with us, and my family helps them assimilate. We get them jobs and homes and ids etc. My heart ached like I'd been punched in the chest. And you think I want to? I gulped. Fall? She shrugged. I don't know. Do you? I hadn't really thought about it. She snorted. Of course you have. We can only see angels that are in between worlds. The ones that are worried, stressed, and thinking that their lives might be better off down here. I opened my mouth to tell her she was wrong, but the smug smile on her face told me I was better off keeping my lies to myself. Now, the question is, why do you want to live down here, Val? Do you want a human life? I inhaled deeply, pushing away the fear that came with even considering that question. Are you in love? She asked suddenly, tilting her head in question at me. Why would you ask me that? I countered. I'm going to ignore the fact that you just literally deflected my question and answer yours. She smiled softly. Love is the usual reason an angel will choose to fall, especially cupids. The rules they push on you guys are just crazy. Not letting you love who you want, seriously. But I've heard other reasons, of course. Wanting to have children, or even, wanting to be mortal and simply have the chance to grow old. My throat tightened, thick with emotion. You've met cupids before who've fallen? Yes, of course. It's my favorite part of this job. Though it's not paid, of course, it's more of a calling than anything. I love helping cupids especially. So back to my question that you so artfully dodged, are you in love, Val? I managed to nod, though fear tingled through me, electrifying every nerve at the admission. Then how can I help you? She asked, setting her cutlery down and leaning back to rub her belly. The pancakes are so good here. Can you tell me more about it? I stammered. The fall. She nodded. Yeah, it's pretty simple really. You have to actually choose to fall, as in, from up there on the clouds. You just jump out your portal, but don't extend your wings. Don't save yourself. You have to fight that instinct. Just let go and pray to land safely. I breathed out slowly, letting this new knowledge flow over me. It sounded so simple, and yet was the angel equivalent to taking my own life. Was I ready for such a thing? Could I ever be? So, will you be falling with another Cupid? Abby asked suddenly. Or are you in love with a human? Ah, I swallowed hard my head spinning with a vengeance. I didn't know any one of this was even an option, so. I. She doesn't know you love her, does she? Abby asked calm as day. She'd obviously had this conversation more times than she could count. She was so confident, and possessed a completely no-nonsense attitude. It was kind of awe-inspiring. I shook my head and forced out a laugh. Do you have mind-reading powers or something as a part of your calling? She grinned. No, but I read faces, and yours is as well printed as the morning paper. I was still grappling with the idea that there were other cupids who'd fallen. So all those angels that go missing. I started, the pieces of the puzzle finally starting to come together. More than likely, they chose to fall and start a life down here, Abby said with a shrug. I've been told your superiors don't let you know that, but it's true. I can hook you up with some ex-cupids my parents have helped over the years if you want. Thanks, I said, sticking my fork into my pancakes and taking another bite. That might be helpful. More information was always a good thing, and if nothing else, I could finally settle an argument I'd had with some of the other cupids for years. Where all those couples went who didn't follow the rules. We'd all just assumed they'd been thrown in celestial jail or were reassigned and separated forbidden from being together. But maybe the truth was that they were actually living their lives on Earth. Together. The idea was just incredible. Abby pushed her empty plate away and clapped her hands together. All right, I think I'm all done here for now. She stood up, pulled some paper bills out of her pocket and placed them on the table. I've got to get home, 
but come find me again if you need me or want me to tee up that meeting for you. How do I do that? I called out before I could stop myself. She pushed open the door to the diner, the bells ringing above her in a musical sign. Just think about how much you need me. I'll get the message. Bye. Then she waved and headed off like she was used to dealing with 300-year-old angels every day. Well, if that isn't one of the strangest encounters of my life, I mused. She'd given me a lot to think about, and that meant I had to talk to Amory and her gaggle of suitors. I'd thought that Tyrone was the worst possible option, but seeing her in the arms of that messenger angel had really boiled my blood and set my temper on fire. He may be bigger and stronger than me, but I'd fight him and anyone else who wanted a piece of her for Amory, if she wanted me to. The realization struck me like lightning, and I exited the diner, willing myself to be invisible in the darkness once more. I'm truly in love with Amory. It wasn't just jealousy, it wasn't just an incredible bond of friendship. I was romantically in love with another Cupid. God help me. Chapter 6 Amory My heart was heavy and sick as Tyrone approached me over breakfast. Hey beautiful, I... Um, can you not? I asked him, shifting away so he wouldn't be able to reach out and touch me. Tyrone's eyebrows rose on his forehead in surprise. What's wrong? How could I explain that I was completely devastated because I'd lost my best friend in the whole universe over the desire to spend an hour in Tyrone's bed? I wanted to scream at someone in frustration, and if Tyrone wasn't careful, it would be him. So instead of making a huge fuss and directing all my anger at Tyrone, I bobbed my head by way of a goodbye, unwilling to commit to a difficult conversation, and got up to take my leave. I needed to head to my bedroom to change clothes for the day anyway. I hadn't seen Val in days now, and I wasn't sure how to even find him. He was never in the eating halls anymore or his bedroom, and the few times I'd asked after him, no one knew where he was. Not even his other friends. I was beginning to worry something was wrong or that something had happened to him. But what could possibly happen to an angel? I wondered in the back of my mind with unease. Despite the fact that Valentine was on my mind, I couldn't ignore my duties. My day was full, with two Cupid arrow couples scheduled to happen on opposite sides of the world. So as soon as I was changed, I grabbed my quiver and bow and moved out. Perhaps work will distract me. I thought. But it was a vain hope. My heart just hurt. I'd never felt this way before. And it wasn't hard to figure out why I felt this way. I'd lost Val's love and friendship in one fell swoop, something I'd stupidly assumed I'd have forever. It was one of those beautiful constants in life, like the sun, the moon, and the glittering stars. I'd always known I loved him, and I relied on him too. But I'd always believed my feelings were more akin to the way humans cared about their siblings. Maybe I was wrong? Because ever since his jealousy caused him to break away from me, I felt like one of my damn arms was missing. That was not the way I should feel about a fellow Cupid. Then it hit me like a thunderbolt, a stark, brutal, and incredible realization, as splendid as a sunset over the ocean. I love Val. Like, really loved him. It wasn't just platonic friendship, and it wasn't simply carnal desire. Nor was it a matter of familial love. I loved him romantically. Why I'd never seen it before was truly baffling. But then again, the rules our superiors placed on cupids were strict and non-negotiable. I'd never thought to question my feelings for Val because I didn't want to think about what it meant, because I already knew there was no future for us. Or any other cupids that might be in love. The reality of that truth was a bitter pill to swallow. So, when I arrived back at my room that night to find Val standing by the door, I was hit by two immediate and overwhelming feelings. Relief made me run up to him, grinning like a lunatic all the while. Then the next feeling had my hand tightening into a fist and slamming into his chest before I could even think to rein in my anger. Where the hell have you been? I demanded. I've been worried sick. Val rubbed his chest where I'd hit him, an eyebrow raised as he indicated toward the door. Can we go in? 
My face was flushed hot with embarrassment. I'd never hit anyone before in my life, and now my hand hurt, but I managed to nod and pressed my palm to the touchscreen that would open the door. What do you want? I asked as I stormed into my room, fire pulsing through my words. Do you still want a man in your bed? He asked unexpectedly, shutting the door behind us. What? I whirled around, startled by his forward question. What are you talking about now? Was he still obsessing over my feelings for Tyrone? A man, he repeated, lifting his chin to point at the mattress behind me. In your bed. You were courting the idea of Tyrone, then that messenger angel. His name is Blake, I answered, crossing my arms over my chest and deliberately squeezing my ribs to make my breasts rise up. A strange growl rolled through Val's chest before he coughed and managed a response. Fine. Blake and Tyrone. Have they assuaged your needs? I frowned at him. What in heaven's name are you talking about? Val ran a frustrated hand through his hair, tugging at its short blonde spikiness. Are you still wanting a man to meet your needs in bed, or have they been met? My belly curled with an unfamiliar warmth, and my arms dropped down from their defensive position, and I suddenly felt strangely vulnerable. I wasn't sure I wanted one, really. I just, I guess. I was flattered by Tyrone's attention. Val stepped closer, his eyes trained on my face. So, you haven't jumped into bed with either of them? I rolled my eyes, a little annoyed again. Why do you keep asking me that? Isn't it obvious? He moved fast, grabbing my upper arms and squeezing lightly. I stared up into his eyes which seemed darker and full of longing. Because I want you, he said, his sexy tone making my knees weak. And if you want someone to make your body sing, choose me. I adore you, Amory. I'll look after you. My jaw dropped at his intentions, but I somehow found the presence of mind to nod. Val's lips crashed down onto mine as though he'd been waiting a lifetime for the chance. I didn't hesitate even a moment in returning his feelings. Not after everything we'd been through all our centuries together, and then this horrible frustration and angst-ridden separation. It was too much. I wasn't missing another moment with him. It was time to listen to my heart. Rules be damned. My arms entwined around his neck as he wrapped me in his embrace. I moaned at the unexpected pleasure of his kiss, but squeezed tight to make sure he didn't pull away. He felt absolutely amazing against me, and I wanted more. Needed more. My fingers twisted in his hair, then trailed down to explore his strong arms. His skin felt gloriously smooth and hot under my hands, but his muscles were hard, corded strength beneath satin. Val's hand slid down to my waistline, then he broke our kiss to pull my thin shirt from my body. Chapter 7 Valentine I rolled onto my back with Amory in my arms, panting like a racehorse on Derby Day. My heart thundered in my chest, and my head was so overwhelmed by pleasure, I couldn't even hear myself think. Wow. That had been so much more amazing than I'd ever imagined it would be. No wonder they didn't let us have love affairs. I mused in post coital bliss. We'd never get out of bed. That was so beautiful. Thank you, Valentine. Amory sighed, nestling into my shoulder to sleep. I was meant to leave her, I knew that. I had to go back to my own room. Those were the rules. The authorities ordained that I break the incredible, earth-shattering connection we just forged with one another. What choice do I have? I tried to roll away. Amory gripped me tighter. Don't even think about going back to your room. Then she glanced up at me and the look in her eyes was deadly serious. You know this is all the love we're allowed for ourselves, I whispered, kissing her on the nose. I can't be missing from my room tonight. They check. She sighed heavily, and finally let me get up. This is crap. I agreed wholeheartedly, but still forced myself to redress and walk to the door. When I gazed back, Amory was the very picture of a perfect angel. Her long blonde hair was softly mussed, her eyes were lust glazed, and her face was rosy with exertion and heat. More than anything, I didn't want to leave her, and it hurt me on so many levels to do so. See you in the morning. She lifted an eyebrow. Will you? 
I assumed that was a non-too-subtle reference to my recent absence. I'll be there. I promise. I blew her a final kiss, then begrudgingly headed out the door. The walk back to my own room was filled with a plethora of conflicting emotions. My body was sated, full of bliss and sweet memories I'd carry with me for the rest of my immortal days. And although my heart was full to overflowing with love for Amory, leaving her after sharing such an experience was heartbreaking. I wanted to hear her steady sleepy breaths as she rested against my chest as I wrapped her up in my protective arms. But it couldn't be. I trudged into my own room and listlessly slipped between the cold, empty sheets. I didn't know how I was going to continue to live like this, loving my best friend, only to have left her alone. But wasn't a little bit of time with Amory better than none? The next morning, I rushed to breakfast to find Amory sitting with that large messenger angel again. Blake. I frowned at them as I approached, wary of the other guy's motives. Good morning. Amory called out, rushing over to give me a big hug, then practically dragged me over to the table. Come sit with us, she urged. Blake's smile was as big as Amory's. I heard you guys had a good night last night. Congrats, cupids. Shish. Amory shushed, whacking Blake on the arm. You weren't supposed to say anything. Blake laughed, then shrugged with a nonchalant smile. The faster he gets up to speed on me, the sooner I can go check out the redhead I have been eyeing off for days now. My stomach was twisted sick with worry, but I tried to think clearly and not overreact. She said they were friends, he reminded himself. Amory? She rolled her eyes. Oh fine. Blake's not into women Val, he likes men. The shock was intense and hit me as hard, fast and as tangibly as the relief did. Then why? Why'd I grab Blondie the other day? Blake asked, filling in the gaps. To make you jealous and force your hand. At the rate you were going, it was going to take months for you to make a move. But. Blake winked at me and got up. I'm going for it. Catch you guys later. And then as if to prove his point, he swaggered over to a table near the buffet and began flirting with Simon. I can't believe it, I said staring after the man I'd actually thought was my legitimate competition. Believe what? Amory asked. That Blake would want to fool you. Or that a guy that hot only wants other hot guys. I glanced from Amory back to Blake, then over to Amory again. Honestly? I don't know. I mean love is love. I just never would have guessed. She chuckled good-naturedly. Sit down, handsome. Tell me how you slept. I sat quickly in the seat opposite her so I could stare into her beautiful eyes and also put some distance between us so that I wouldn't reach out and touch her. She quirked an eyebrow at me, looking a little crestfallen. So far away. I managed to smile in return. You know the rules. Plus, if I get any closer, I'll jump your bones while you're still seated in that chair. Her audible little gasp and subsequently flushed cheeks did nothing to stop the desire that simmered in my groin, just waiting for its chance to burst into a full-blown inferno of passion. Damn it. Well, maybe we could finish breakfast first, she asked, gulping. I smiled at her enthusiasm. I'd assumed she'd enjoyed last night as much as I had, but her verbal confirmation was everything. I would love to, but I've got a priority one this morning and only have a 30-minute window to get to them, so have to fly. Later. Her hazel eyes shone with love as she nodded with pursed lips. I stood up to leave, even though it was the very last thing I wanted to be doing this morning. Surprising me, Amory jumped up and ran around the table, throwing herself into my arms. I caught her and wrapped her up in my embrace. Her scent washed over me, intoxicating my senses, and I couldn't stop myself from dropping my head to inhale more deeply. God you smell good, I breathed against her ear. She giggled and pulled away, the sound of happiness infectious. Later, she echoed. Her eyes twinkled with promise. Despite the fact I was literally dying to kiss her cherry red lips and devour every last inch of her beauty, I merely nodded and dragged myself away by sheer force of will, gritting my teeth all the way. Work first. Play later. 
I marched through the dining room door, barely able to feel my feet on the carpet as I headed for the portal. I'd lived in the clouds all my life for literal centuries, but for the first time this place actually felt like heaven, the way humans described it as being like paradise, where the heart felt whole and there was nothing but joy. My job for the day, priority one, was an important match, but not a natural one. The man and woman wouldn't have necessarily ended up together under normal circumstances, but it was deemed their children were integral to the next generation. So I dutifully knocked my arrow and made the match. The orders came from the higher-ups, and I wasn't in a position to question them. By the time I got back to the portal, it was dinner time, and the dining room was full once again with bustling, chattering angels. I walked over to where Blake stood with a group of friends, a guy that I was beginning to like. I see you've told your guys about ours, I said as I approached. Blake turned around with a grin and shook my hand, a wicked glint in his eye. What can I say? The candy down here is delicious. I could only assume he wasn't talking about our buffet table. I opened my mouth to make a joke and continue the conversation, but was quickly distracted. Amory glided up next to me, looking absolutely scrumptious. I extended my arm, pulling her into my side possessively. Her arms slunk around my waist just as naturally, as though she'd done it a thousand times before. Have a good day, she asked, tilting her head back and smiling up at me. I dropped a kiss on her lips without thinking, and an immediate silence fell over the room. I pulled back, withdrawing from her. Yeah, it was a good day. Her eyes were wide and round and there was a distinct touch of hurt in their depths, as though she'd taken my necessary physical rejection personally. How about yours? I managed to force out, though everyone continued to stare at us. Even Blake shifted uncomfortably. Shall we go eat? He asked aloud, stepping over to Amory before throwing his arm over her shoulders in a slouchy, casual way. Any envy I would have felt at that kind of move in the past was gone, replaced with a gratitude for the kinship he was expressing. See you at the table's Val, he called over his shoulder. I smiled at Blake as he took my woman away. My woman, yes she was. My woman. Always. I loaded up my plate with a mouth-watering variety of sweets and tried to stroll as calmly as I could, before sitting next to Amory. She toyed with drink and was unusually quiet. Acutely aware that eyes could still be on us, I swallowed down enough food to sustain me, but it wasn't my physical hunger plaguing my thoughts. Blake and a couple of the other messenger angels chatted around us. Their chilled take-no-shit vibes seemed to bring down the level of unease in the dining room. All the same, as soon as I could, I cleaned my plate and held my hand out to Amory. She stared up at me with her big eyes, shining with a striking celestial gold that put even the stars to shame. Ready for bed? I asked. She took my hand without hesitation and nodded. We said our goodbyes to the messenger angels, then I led her out of the dining room and into the hall, away from the prying eyes of the other cupids. I'd always known the rules regarding relations between angels were important to the cupids, but their collective reaction to my affection for Amory was disturbing to say the least. I was pretty sure I'd seen other cupids engage in brief displays of public affection. What was so strange about our kiss? Will they inform our superiors about us? I wondered. Your room or mine? I asked, pushing the thought aside, desperate to claim any time I could with her. Yours, she answered quickly. I didn't argue. When we were finally inside the safety of my room, I pulled Amory into my arms and kissed her, hard, infusing the kiss with all of my yearning and desire. Before I'd had my fill, she pulled back, a look of confusion and pain on her beautiful face. I'm sorry. I wish things were different, I whispered, as I cupped her cheek and brushed errant wisps of blonde hair from her eyes. With a look of anguished determination, she pulled me against her lovely warm body and refused to let me go. Chapter 8 Amory I lay with my head over Valentine's heart, the rhythmic thumping beneath my ear both soothing and exciting. I him to know how much this time meant to me with all my heart. I never knew, I said, my throat breaking with emotion. I coughed to clear my throat then tried again. 
No chuckled, the sound rumbling through his chest and into my ear. No. Why would they? We'd never get our jobs done. I rolled onto my belly and rested my chin on his chest, shuffling to get comfortable so I could look up into his handsome face. Why didn't we ever do this before now? I asked. Didn't you want to? He glanced away, failing to answer my question. I reached up to hold his face and tugged him back to look at me. Don't hide from me, Val. His lips were thin and pressed together and he remained silent. Pain skewered my heart. What aren't you telling me? Has there been someone else? The very idea of Val pleasuring someone else in the way he'd done to me made my stomach clench. When he didn't answer, I pushed myself up on my hands, determined to get some separation. Fine, I said into the silence between us. You could have just told me. He grabbed my arms and pulled me back down, squashing me to his chest. Stop it, I growled at him, pushing against his pecs. Let me go. No, he whispered, holding me firm. The softness of his tone was so at odds with the anger in my heart that I did as he asked. I stopped thrashing and just glared at him, confused and annoyed. What then? He inhaled sharply. Stay. Sleep here with me. I rolled my eyes at him. You know that's against the rules, and I don't want to anyway. Go find another angel to warm your bed, since you're not as choosy as you pretended to be. Again, I tried to roll away. Again, he stopped me. This time I groaned at him. What is wrong with you? He laughed and let me go this time, stretching like a languishing cat in bed. I've asked myself that too many times to count. I grabbed my clothes that lay on the ground. You're talking nonsense, Valentine, and I'm not in the mood. My eyes prickled with hot angry tears, and I tried to blink them away. I was hurt, and I had no right to be. Val could have whoever he wanted in his bed. He was on his feet and pulling the clothes back out of my hands before I blinked. No, I'm not. You just don't understand. Don't understand what? I snapped, raising my volume. He got even closer and snarled back. That I've loved you for as long as I can remember. My mouth opened and closed soundlessly like the goldfish I'd seen kept in a human's homes. Val turned away, both hands on his hips. What do you mean? I whispered into the silence that blossomed in the wake of his confession. What did that have to do with who he slept with? He didn't turn around to face me, but he kept talking. I mean exactly what I said, Amory. I've loved you for centuries. As a friend, or? He whirled around. Just always, Amory. Don't you get it? I've never shared another Cupid's bed because I've only ever wanted you. Loved you. He stopped to take a frustrated breath, then continued. But we can't fall in love. We're not allowed to. You know that. So I've kept my feelings to myself all this time. How much I love you. Everything. Fuck it. Amory. I worship the ground you walk on, isn't that obvious? But but you left me last night after we? This wasn't making any sense. Val's laugh was bitter as he hammered himself in the chest. And that broke my heart to leave you. It was fucking horrible. I hated it. All I want to do is wake up every morning with your body against mine. I want to hear your heart beating as I fall asleep forever. I rushed at him, my heart acting on pure instinct. Then do that. If you feel that way, stay with me. Always. I wanted him to, more than I could say in words. Not just physically, but in all ways. I'd been oblivious and in denial, too long. So much wasted time. I lamented. He kissed me fast and hard, hard enough to bruise my lips. I jumped up and wrapped myself around him, ripping his waist tight with my thighs while raking my fingers through his hair. He thrust his tongue into my mouth and twisted us around, lowering us onto the bed carefully. But I didn't want gentle. Don't leave, Val whispered into the dark, absently stroking my hair. I kissed his shoulder where I'd settled, listening to his heartbeat. I love you too. I whispered back into the darkness. Valentine. 
The next morning Amory had to rush off to work, but not until we'd made love again. It was strange. I'd assumed that after the first time or two, my desire for her would dampen, or at least I'd feel some sense of satiation. But it was the exact opposite. I'd made raw, beautiful, and primal love to her three times in a day and a half, and if anything, I craved her even more. I was plagued by the desire to touch her all the time. I wanted to be with her, kiss her, and love her. After she left, I had a quick shower, then headed to the dining room for breakfast. Amory had an important job this morning that was so urgent she said she needed to skip mealtime altogether and fly straight down to earth. I didn't try to change her mind or delay her any further, work was the most important part of our day, but I'd miss her while she was gone. After a leisurely breakfast, I was just making my way back down the hallway when my name was called. Valentine, can I have a word? I looked up and saw Declan, one of our supervisors. Yeah, of course. I altered my course and followed him down another corridor, one that housed the senior Angel's rooms. Oh shit. He wanted a real talk. We entered a small meeting room, and I sat down at the table, my curiosity piqued. Is there something wrong, Declan? I asked preemptively. My heart was pounding a little harder than it should have been. I wasn't brought in for reprimand often, though it had happened from time to time. Not yet, Valentine. Not yet? I watched as Declan shuffled some paperwork and pointedly avoided my gaze. Something was wrong, that was for damn sure. If this is about all the messenger angels in the dining room. I began, guessing at the issue he wanted to discuss. His gaze snapped up to mine and his eyebrows furrowed into a frown. No. It's not. What are you so worried about then? I pressed. Amory, he said quietly. My heart practically stopped beating in my chest, and the world shrunk around me. Amory? I repeated more warily. What about her? We have been made aware that you have begun a sexual relationship with her. I cringed internally. What an ugly way to explain some of the most beautiful moments of my life. Our love involved sex for sure, and we both enjoyed it, but our connection was so much deeper than that. I went on the offensive. We have. And. There are no laws against sharing a bed on occasion. In fact, I've been informed that it's encouraged among the messenger angels. Declan sighed heavily, as though this was a conversation he dreaded, but needed to have often. Messenger angels have the ability to enjoy physical relationships with little to no emotions. Cupids are designed differently. Designed. I murmured, hating this meeting more with every minute that passed. We literally spend our existence shooting arrows at humans to create relationships that wouldn't exist otherwise. That doesn't mean we aren't capable of having relationships like the messengers do. We're all angels after all. I wanted years with Amory, not nights. Centuries, even. Look, Valentine, Declan said, his tone taking on a hard edge. We have strict rules on Cupid relationships for a reason, whether you understand or not, and you've already spent two nights with Amory. I stood up and glared down at him. How do you know that? Sit down, Val. No, I said, my anger unfurling like a blazing supernova. I've slept alone for hundreds of years, and now you're telling me I've had enough physical contact with Amory after two nights? Get fucked, I spat defiantly. Declan didn't flinch, but he stood up with an eerie calm. He was at least three inches taller than me, and glowered down with all the power he had. You are forbidden to have her in your bed again, Valentine. Do you understand? I lifted my chin and glared right back. Or what? I challenged. Or we'll separate you. For life. My breath whistled through my teeth. That would kill me, or worse. Why would you do that, Declan? That is the definition of cruelty. He didn't respond, but I could see his fast dissolving patience in the set of his shoulders and the clench of his jaw. Let's work through this logically. I said, pressing my hands onto the desk in front of me. I'm a Cupid, which means my heart has to desire love in the world for me to be effective. So, you threaten to take away the one thing that's making me happy. 
Valentine, the supervisor warned. No, Declan. No, I said, standing up and straightening my spine to my full height. You can't tell me that you think I'd be a better Cupid if you separate me from the one person in the whole world that I loathe. As soon as the words started forming on my lips, I knew it was too late to retract and bite my tongue. Declan took a big breath, then sighed as though the weight of the world was on his shoulders. I'll inform my superiors that Amory and you are to be separated for good. She will be moved as of tomorrow. You can't do that. I can, Declan snapped, and I will. But. No buts, Valentine. Not this time, Declan said, then stormed out. I fell into my seat and put my head in my hands. Oh fuck. What am I going to do now? Chapter 9 Amory Tonight, I was going to do something special for Val. I wanted to explore his body like he'd explored mine. The idea of tying him up and telling him that he wasn't allowed to move while I ran my tongue over him, all over him, was tremendously appealing. He was always the one pleasuring me, and loving me. I wanted a chance to return the favor, to show him that I appreciated his beautiful body as much as he did mine. I was just lounging in my bedroom, fantasizing about what I'd do to Val, when there was an urgent, rapid knock at my door. Amory? Open up. I raced over to open the door, and found Val standing on the other side. He wasn't smiling, in fact he looked angry as hell. Val? What's wrong? Are you okay? This was not the meeting I'd been expecting. He pushed past me and into my room as he ran an agitated hand through his hair. Amory, we have to talk. Now. Yeah, sure. Images of Val's naked body in my bed disappeared from my mind as his worry clouded the room. What's wrong? I asked, urging him to explain. I closed the door behind him and invited him to sit. But Val wouldn't be calmed. He was pacing, still frantic. I jumped back onto my bed and crossed my legs, watching my lover and best friend freak out, hoping he'd open up when he was ready. Val ran both hands through his hair, tugged at his uniform, and paced like his life depended on it. Talk to me, Val. What's going on? You're starting to freak me out. Surely he didn't think I still wanted Blake, or Tyrone, did he? Was this a jealousy thing, or had something happened? Finally, he stopped moving and faced me, his heart in his eyes. They want to separate us, Amory. They're going to move you to the other side of the world. My stomach twisted, and I swallowed hard to stop the sour bile from rising up my throat. They want to move me. I whispered, my voice quavering. But no. I didn't want to go. It wasn't right. Anger and hurt rose up lightning fast and I shot to my feet in a frazzled panic, adrenaline now zinging around my veins. They can't. I protested. They can and they will, he countered, shifting his feet uneasily. They don't want us together. But we're not together, I told him, my heart screaming out at the lie. Nothing was official. What we wanted and what could be were two very different things. We're best friends. We're colleagues, I reason. I mean, we've slept together, but... The crestfallen look on Val's face gave me pause. What else happened, Valentine? What aren't you telling me? I... I'm so sorry, Amory, he began, his arms falling in defeat. I told him that I loved you. There's no taking it back. My heart leapt and my gaze instantly found his. You, you told him that. Yes, he admitted. It was Declan. He called me in for a meeting and it became a confrontation. And it just came out. I couldn't help it. I'm so sorry. He stepped forward and grabbed my hands, his expression apologetic and plaintive. I shouldn't have told him that. This is all my fault. Why not? I whispered, the world falling away around me. It's the truth, isn't it? Every time Val declared his true feelings, my own feelings for him became clearer and clearer. How had I not known before that this man loved me so ardently? And how the hell had I remained in denial so long over the stark truth that I loved him just as much? I couldn't imagine a world without him. 
The very idea sent shards of ice splintering through my soul. He nodded and licked his lips in a tellingly anxious gesture. Of course it is, but that's the reason they're separating us, because I love you. Their fucked up rules say that I can't possibly love you and still be a functional and effective Cupid. I pulled him over to the bed and pulled him to sit down next to me on the mattress. What can we do? I asked, my heart in my throat. The last thing I wanted was be separated from Val. Well, we could, he pressed his lips into a thin line and stopped talking mid-sentence. We could what? I asked, waiting for his response. The only thing my mind was coming up with was, run away. But where would we run? And what would we do when we got there? This was the only life we'd ever known. We were cupids. We were literally created for a single purpose. How could we escape that? We could fall, he whispered, his blue eyes boring into mine. FFFF. I couldn't even say it. Fall. No. Never. I liked being an angel. I didn't want to die. Hear me out, Val said softly, squeezing my hands a little tighter. I met this human girl the last time I went down to Earth. Her name is Abby, and she told me that she's an angel coordinator of sorts. A what? What does that even mean? I asked, my voice reaching a squeaky pitch as I battled to contain my feelings. She helps angels who decide to fall, to be human. She helps set them up with jobs, ids, money, all those necessary things. What he was suggesting sounded impossible. It sounded absurd. And you want to do that? I whispered, my mouth falling open in shock. But why? I couldn't imagine wanting to be human. That just wasn't. Me. Because I want to be with you, Amory, Val answered, reaching up to cup my face and staring into my eyes with more love than I'd ever seen in anyone's gaze before. I want to be able to love you and sleep with you and never leave you. I want to be able to live a life with you. I tore my gaze away from Val's and slipped from the bed. You want us to fall? To give up being angels? Val, I can't do that. My heart was hammering like a tribal drum of war, and I couldn't make it stop. Fear radiated through me, and I felt afraid in a way that made me physically sick to the stomach. I know it's a lot, Val said, standing up and walking towards the door. I know you love being a Cupid, Amory. I know, I do too. But I also know that I can't live without you, and I certainly don't want to. My breath caught in my throat. An avalanche of conflicting emotions threatened to bury me alive. Val, don't say that. I stammered. I have to be honest, Amory, he answered. You've become my everything. I need to be with you. But we can't do that. I cried back, gripping my head with my hands. It felt like my brain was about to explode. We, my life, your... Oh. It was all too much and far too soon. How could I find love and have it snatched away so quickly? Surely there's another way. Some other option. I couldn't live without Val either, but I couldn't stop being a Cupid. It's what I was. Maybe if I went to Declan and begged, maybe he'd give us more time? We've got until tomorrow to decide, Amory said Val, as if reading my mind. Fuck. I screamed inside. Fuck. 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 He walked over to the door, and with every step my throat tightened. Val? I'm not going to force you into anything you don't want to do, Amory. I love you too much for that. So, if you want to live on different sides of the world and keep our jobs, then we can do that. So you won't? I pressed my fingertips to my lips, unable to ask the question. Would he fall without me? Leave me to exist without him? Would he truly abandon me, to be alone forever? He smiled sadly as if he had preempted exactly what I was going to say. No. Of course not. Then he walked away, taking my heart with him. And that was the first time in our entire celestial existence that I'd watched my best friend lie to me. My soul crumbled. I felt like I'd gained the world overnight and then lost it just as quickly, and it stung more than any lie ever could. Chapter 10 
Valentine. I went to bed with a heavy heart. A heart that was breaking in fact. If Amory decided to stay in the clouds and be a Cupid on the other side of the world, then I wouldn't stand in her way. But I also wouldn't just watch her fly away, then return to my life as a Cupid, giving everyone else love while mine was taken away from me. No. I wouldn't do it. I'd wait for Amory to make her choice, then I'd officially make mine. Though in my heart, I already knew what mine would be. I wouldn't be staying to serve as a Cupid. There was no way. I'd taken my chances on Earth and started over. Breakfast wasn't a priority this morning. I didn't have the stomach for it. So instead, I had a long hot shower and read over my daily reports. Ultimately, Amory would either come to tell me that she'd changed her mind and that we'd fall together, or I'd go out for dinner, and she'd be gone. There weren't any other options, according to the supervisors. And if that truly was the case, then I wouldn't have any other choice either. Dressed and ready for the day, I tried to focus on other things, but as time wore on and Amory didn't come, the sickness inside my stomach only grew. She isn't coming, the doubtful inner voice whispered. The truth of it was slowly but surely tearing me up inside. I loved her and had told her I'd change my whole life for her. I'd give up heaven and my wings for her, and it was looking more and more like she was going to choose her job. I wanted to hate her for it, I really did. I wanted to lash out and unleash the sea of emotional turmoil boiling away within me. But the stark reality was most angels didn't consider what we did a job. It was a calling, and their only and entire reason for being. That wasn't how I felt, not anymore. And without Amory, my reasons for remaining a Cupid were fast fading. The light of my days was gone. My reason for getting up in the morning. My smile, my laugh. The foundation of my life from which my happiness had sprung from. All gone, wiped out in the blink of an eye. I stood in front of my bathroom mirror and stared at myself for a long while, letting my wings unfurl and become visible. They were beautiful, but not unlike a bird's wings. I'd be able to see them, again. On a dove. Or any other of God's avian creatures. But I would miss them. I reached out with my fingers and caressed my feathers, feeling their comforting touch on both sides, as though caressing my skin, but ever so slightly. Our wings were a part of being an angel, but not in the manner of normal limbs. They were a heavenly gift, an intangible miracle, and when I fell, they would cease to be. Part of me wished I had a camera to take a photo so that I could look at them in the future, when they were gone. But I didn't need a picture, truthfully. I'd never forget what they looked like or how they felt. My wings had been a part of me for my entire existence, and even when they were no more than a memory, I wouldn't forget. Never. I took off my Cupid uniform and pulled out a pair of casual pajama-style pants I'd rarely had the occasion to wear. They were thin and gray, but comfortable. A quick shower later, and any remnants of who I used to be were washed away like summer rain. I pulled the pants on and took a deep steadying breath. It was time to move on to the next phase of my life, and there was no one to say goodbye to. Not anymore. I made my bed and cleaned up so that the next angel would have a nice space to live in. When I fell, another angel would be created, a soul to take my place. No one would miss me. The void of my existence would soon be filled. A deep sweeping sadness washed over me, and I let it take me down. Let it embrace me like a long-lost lover until I felt ready to let go, then I pushed it away. The walk to the portal was shorter than I remembered, and as I ambled along, every step brought me closer to the end of my angelic life and an existence without Amory. I nodded numbly at other cupids as I walked, for the very last time. It felt like the well-worn trail to the hangman's noose. The portal was closed, and my heart thumped harder and faster as I stood in front of the door to the human realm. It was a door I'd flown through thousands of times before. But today would be different. I took a deep painful breath and yanked it open. The pain wasn't simply pain though, it was excitement, tainted by a touch of fear. Perhaps a little resentment too. There was just too much to hold inside myself. I couldn't bear its burden anymore. 
Air blew past my face as the clouds reached up to meet me like they always had. I leaned into the cold rush of the wind and closed my eyes. Valentine. No. Strong hands pulled me back. I turned around, shocked to find Amory there, preventing me from falling. It felt like a dream. Amory? I gasped as I grabbed for her hands and stared at her. She was wearing the same plain clothes that I was. I thought they'd moved you already. She swallowed, gulping loudly. I well they tried. Ripples of pain and feelings I'd never seen before, raced across her face in a kaleidoscope of emotion. I stepped even closer. What's happened, Amory? I. I. What is it, love? I asked, cupping her face desperately, elation warring with concern. Talk to me. She dropped her gaze then looked up at me, her eyes a stunning gold in the portal light. I want to go with you, she whispered, her lips trembling as she spoke. I could feel the fear pulsing through her. Are you sure? I whispered, afraid to ask the question. I didn't want her to take it back. Not now. She'd finally said the words I'd been praying for. She nodded and blinked, sending tears streaming down her lovely cheeks. I dropped my hands away slowly, worried she might be sacrificing the life she truly wanted for me. Amory, I won't stand in the way of your happiness. I don't want you to live with regret. If you want to stay here. No. No I don't, she said, rushing forward to grab my hands again. I want you and I want to be with you, I'm just scared Valentine. I've never thought about leaving before. Neither had I, I admitted. Not until you kissed me. She smiled at me through her crystalline tears. How did a kiss change everything? I could see it was my turn to convince her that I loved and needed her. Because I'd spent years knowing I loved you, but if you never returned my feelings, then it was okay. I'd have stayed here in the clouds just to be with you. But I do love you, she whispered, making my heart sore. And that's why I want to go, I explained. Because here, we can't love one another. Here we're not free. We are servants who must put our own needs to the side for the good of mankind. And I'm done doing that, Amory. I've served for hundreds of years now, more than anything in the world. I just want to love you. She glanced off to the side as someone walked past us, smiling to reassure them that everything was okay, even if it wasn't. So, we'll be human, she said, stepping closer and wrapping her arms around herself. Yes? I asked, hearing the question behind her words. So what will we do, she asked, her eyes no longer red or teary. I laughed, lifting my hands in prayer. Whatever we want to do. We can get married, have children, grow old together. Children, she whispered, her face growing rosy with happiness. If we can, I answered with a smile. And if that's what you would like. She nodded and came close again, lifting her chin in invitation. I wasn't about to let that opportunity pass me by. I dropped my head and kissed her lips with renewed passion. She wrapped her arms around my neck and kissed me back, moaning softly in the back of her throat when my tongue swept between her lips to taste her sweetness. When I pulled back, there was a crowd forming around us now. Cupids, watching and waiting to see what would happen next. I could feel the presence of an authority coming, so I grabbed her hand and turned back toward the door. Are you ready, my love? I asked, hope swelling my heart. She nodded, taking the final step towards the door. What do we do? Abby said we just fall. She stared into my eyes, nothing but love and excitement showing in their golden-flecked hazel depths now. Okay. Let's do it. Together. Valentine. Wait. It was Declan. There was no time to spare. Let's go, love. I stepped through the doorway with her, and I didn't extend my wings. I fought the age-old instinct and closed my eyes. And with my hand holding tight to my only reason for being. I fell. Chapter 11 Amory The smell of grass tickled my nose and I sneezed loudly. Ow! My head thumped with the pain of sneezing so hard. And as I lay on my back assessing my body, everything felt odd. What's wrong with me? 
goodness, that's a lot to deal with this morning, I said to myself, rolling over and sitting up despite the strange sense of lethargy and pain in my muscles. I expected to find myself in bed in my bedroom, high up in the clouds of heaven, but I wasn't. I appeared to be on earth, and everything hurt. Confusion washed over me. Was someone playing a joke on me? Was I meant to be on a job? What was going on? What the? I breathed. I was in a field filled with flowers, dirt, and grass. It was late afternoon, and the sun was just dipping below the horizon. The sky was heart-achingly beautiful, and the sunset had more colors in its visage than I'd ever noticed before. I blinked twice, then rubbed my eyes. What in the name of? Why was I suddenly seeing and feeling things I'd never known before? It didn't make any sense. Then it all came rushing back to me like a television being plugged in, flashes of images racing across the screen, the pieces of a puzzle falling into place. Valentine. I fell, I whispered, then covered my mouth with my hand, where my lips felt different. Everything felt different. My whole body. My eyes. My skin. But where was my love? Oh my god. Val. I jumped to my feet, a feeling of urgency surging through me. Val Valentine. Where are you? I called out, my panic rising the more times I called only to receive no answer. He wasn't anywhere near me. My stomach dipped and lurched, making me feel sick. Where is he? I fretted. He'd fallen too. We'd fallen together. So, we could love each other forever. We'd been holding hands on the way down. How did we come to be separated? Oh no. I looked around, my eyes scanning the area, and couldn't see any signs that another angel had fallen alongside me. I had to go. I had to do something. I had to find him. I stumbled towards the tree line, then stopped suddenly, jerking my knee painfully. Damn it. I was wearing the same pajamas I'd put on when they tried to move me, and no shoes. My feet ached and my mind raced. I had to get to safety. Was there a road nearby? Where should I go? Hot tears filled my eyes and panic splintered my heart. Reality hit me like a rock in the face. I was completely and utterly alone, with no friends, no Val, and no plans or knowledge of even where I was. And I was fucking terrified. In the distance there was a sudden movement, and I stopped walking to stare out into growing darkness. There was a flicker of color that seemed to be in the shape of a person, though it was hard to tell with my new eyes. My angel vision was gone. I squinted towards them, and finally, I could make out a face. And blonde hair. Yes. Definitely human. I started running towards them, falling forwards as soon as I tried moving faster than a staggering pace. I was completely off balance without my wings. I tried walking forward again, but tripped over a rock in the dirt and fell to the ground. Pain like I'd never felt before tore at my hands, and I cried out at the new and unpleasant sensation. Defeated by the sheer act of walking, I gave up and rolled onto my ass, hot tears burning my eyes. I didn't try to get up, I just stayed there. I was hopeless. How did humans make this look so damn easy? The human walking towards me, who turned out to be a woman, finally reached me. Hello, she said with a big smile. Do you need a hand? She reached out for me and waited patiently. I just stared at her beautiful face. She had long blonde hair and pretty blue eyes like Valentine. It's okay, she said brightly. Take it. I won't hurt you. With a sigh, I took her offered hand and hauled myself to my feet. Who are you? I ventured. She grinned. I'm Abigail. Relief flooded through me. You're the angel agent, the helper person. Val told me that he talked to you. You can call me Abby. The woman in front of me was young and very beautiful, and a flicker of jealousy struck my heart in an unfamiliar way. It felt disturbingly personal. I wasn't sure I liked it at all. Abby chuckled and thrust her hands into her jeans pockets. It's not like that at all. Don't worry. I don't go for angels. I brushed my hands together to get rid of the dirt. 
That made sense in a way, since most of the angels she would find herself helping would be in a loving pair that fell together anyway. Like Val and I. Ah yes, I fumbled. Okay, thank you. So, do you know where he is? Abby grinned at me again, flashing her pearly whites. Yes, well, sort of. I got the call saying that two angels fell tonight. I came to get you, and my cousin Billy went to the other site. It's a few hours' drive away, though. My breath caught in my throat and my heart filled with another new emotion. Disappointment. Oh. That's far. She smiled and turned around, offering her arm to me. Come along and hold on to me. You'll find it hard walking in the beginning, but you'll get better at it really soon. Don't worry. I grabbed onto her arm and together we walked back to where she'd parked her car. She opened the door and instructed me to get in. As I sank into the seat, I'd never felt so relieved to be able to sit down. Every part of me ached in the strangest and most foreign way. I already felt exhausted, and I hadn't done anything but fall. Abby shut the door, raced around to her side, and hopped in. Here, she said, handing me a bag. This is an ARK, an angel rescue kit. There's a bottle of water, a few Advil, and some jelly beans. The Advil will help alleviate some of the aching, and the glucose and water will give you back a little energy. You want me to take all this now? I asked, not having the foggiest idea about anything she'd just said. She smiled and took the bag back, rifling through it. Yep. Here. I'll help you. Abby grabbed the bottle of water, twisted off the top, then popped two white pills into her open palm. Here, drink this and then swallow these down like you would food. They'll make you feel better soon, I promise. I didn't know this young human woman from a daisy in a field, but Val had met her and seemed to trust her, so I did as she advised. Good job, she praised, even though it took me four half-choked attempts to get the stupid little pills down my throat. They kept making me gag. I was not a fan. Now, munch away on these while I drive you to Val. She handed me a huge bag of multicolored jelly beans and grinned at me again. Her sense of kindness and joy was a tad infectious. I could see why Val had been quick to speak well of her. Thanks, I said, resting back into the chair and sticking my hand into the bag and grabbing some of the candy. You're certainly organized. Abby started the car and pulled out onto the road, darkness falling more deeply as night rapidly approached. You'll be my 22nd angel in the last five years, she admitted. So yeah, I'm pretty organized these days. 22 angels just for you. I repeated. That sounded like a lot. She shrugged. Yeah. The first couple taught me a lot, hence the go-to bag. I didn't realize you guys would be in pain or be hungry and thirsty the second you hit the ground. It just didn't occur to me, unfortunately. But I know now. Is there anything else you want to report? I stuffed more sugar into my mouth and shook my head. No. You're doing excellent and I'm grateful. She laughed at the compliment. Thanks, Amory. I stared at her. You know who I am? She nodded. Of course. That's part of my orders. I get told who to pick up and where from. It's a pretty good system, actually. Do you know who sends the orders through? I asked, wondering about the angel supervisors and which ones would get this job. No, I don't. Sorry, she said. I believed her. She had no reason to lie. Don't be, I said. It doesn't matter. I closed my eyes and rested my head back. I won't get to see them again, anyway. We drove for hours and I nodded off, sleeping as we traveled. Abby had been right about me being tired. I felt horrible in lots of ways I couldn't quite yet describe. Finally, Abby pulled the car over in front of a motel with flashing neon lights. Their garish light flickered into my consciousness, and I forced myself to wake up. Where are we? I asked. Just a motel my cousin and I agreed we'd meet at. Billy should have booked you guys in for a week already. By then we'll have your house, jobs, ids, and everything sorted so you can start your new human life. This is just temporary while we iron out the wrinkles. 
I stared past the windshield at the bright pink flamingo and swallowed hard. I hope so. Abby laughed. Come on, let's go. You must be dying to see Valentine, right? I was, and as she said it, my heart lifted. Seeing him would make everything all right, I was sure of it. Love conquers all, I reminded myself. It was the Cupid creed. Abby jumped out of the driver's side of the car, then came around to mine and opened the door for me. Come on. We're almost there. She checked her cell phone, then she grabbed my hand. Billy said they're in room 205. So let's do it. And don't forget your water. I put my water, pills, and candy back into the bag Abby had given me and managed to get to my feet with her assistance. The pain had receded and although I still felt lightheaded, I was feeling noticeably better. Thank you for the bag, I managed to say as she shut the car door. I feel a lot better now. She offered me her arm with a smile. I took it, though butterflies of anxiety fluttered to life within me. I was going to see my love, my Val, and it was somehow exciting and nerve-wracking at the same time. I felt like a wonky debutante still trying to find my feet. You're so welcome, Amory. Let's get this reunion happening. And without another delay, Abby dragged me towards the stairs. With her help, I climbed my way to my new life. One exhausting but thrilling step at a time. Chapter 12 Valentine It was ridiculous to believe, but I was proud of the fact that I was pacing the hotel room and not falling over constantly like a toddler anymore. Those first few hours had been rough. No one had told me how painful falling would be, nor prepared me for how different I'd feel when my body was finally human and no longer angelic. Not that anyone had told me anything, really. Truthfully, it was even more ridiculous to think that I'd fallen with little more than a short conversation with Abby. But I'd chosen to fall with hope that I was doing the right thing, for both Amory and me. There was no future for us in heaven. Our hand had been forced, but we were going to make the best of it. As long as we had each other, we could figure the rest out along the way. Are you sure they're coming? I asked Billy again, stopping to turn and stare at him. Billy, the rather sour-tempered cousin of Abby's, answered me dispassionately. Of course they are. They'll be here soon. It's a fair drive. Billy had been curt at best since we first met, and he sighed a lot. I resumed my pacing, feeling lost, nervous, and strange still. The painkillers had definitely helped relieve the general achiness that assaulted my physical body, but it hadn't eased my mind or stopped me worrying for Amory. Where is she? I wondered. Was she okay? Did Abby say how Amory was? I asked Billy. Far out. Billy shook his head and opened his cell phone. They're actually here. I raced to the door, stumbling over my foot as I did. Slow down, Billy advised, and not for the first time. It's going to take weeks for you to adjust your weight and being wingless. Ignoring him, my heart soaring, I wrenched open the door and there she was, my love, looking as fragile and beautiful as a newborn child. Amory, I breathed, reaching out to her. She flew into my arms practically launching herself at me, before falling heavily against me. I stumbled back into the room, laughing at the happiness now bubbling inside of me. It's so good to see you, beautiful girl, I said as we practically fell into the room to sit on the bed. Abby was behind her. She closed the door and went to embrace her cousin. I sat on the mattress with Amory beside me, my hands gripping hers tightly. I never wanted to let go. Are you okay? I asked, infusing my tone with comfort and concern. She nodded, her lower lip trembling slightly. Yes I am, she assured me. But everything is so strange. I momentarily let go of her hand, so that I could cup her cheek and appreciate her human beauty. She leaned into my caress and sighed. I know it feels strange, I had to agree with her there, but there are lots of good things too, I'm certain we'll discover them together. Abby walked over to us and pulled out a wad of cash from her back pocket. We're going to head off and leave you guys to it. The room's paid for, but we didn't have a lot of time to get food or anything. 
Valentine's Day is so busy every year, it's like all you cupids suddenly realize there's more to life than giving others love. I glanced at Amory. She just leaned into me, resting her weary head on my shoulder. Abby reached out even further, so I lifted my hand and took the cash she offered. So this is for food? I clarified. She nodded. Yeah, there's a diner just down the road and a bit of food in the fridge. You'll need to remember to eat and drink a lot of water regularly, okay? I nodded. Okay. And not just sugar, she said with a grin. I know you cupids are sugarholics, but now that you're human, your bodies will need fruit and vegetables and protein too. I managed to smile in return. Thank you for all your help, both of you. We won't forget this. Hey Coos, we've got to go, Billy said. Abby began backing towards the door. We've got another couple to help out tonight, but I'll pop back tomorrow and see how you're getting on, okay? Amory finally moved, getting up and shuffling towards Abby. Thank you. The two girls embraced. I immediately felt the love and kinship in the room. Um, so I haven't lost all Cupid instincts. That was a good thing. Billy opened the door and with a final wave, left. I'll see you tomorrow, Abby promised, pulling out of Amory's arms. Then we'll be by again later in the week with all your papers. Oh, and make sure you lock the door behind me, okay? You have to look out for your own safety now. Unfortunately, not all humans are as well-meaning as we are, so take care of each other. Thanks, Abby. We will. I managed to call out before she too left. Amory shut the door behind her, then turned the lock so it clicked into place. I took her hand and led her back to the bed. How are you feeling, really? She shrugged. Okay, I guess. The pain is better now, and I can almost walk straight. Though I'm pretty sure a duck could outrun me at this point. I chuckled. The bar is pretty low today, isn't it? She staggered. I think I'm going to take a shower, then lie down. Her hand was small and warm in mine, so I gently tugged her towards the bathroom. Let's shower together, then I'm more than happy to go straight to bed. Can we just sleep? She asked, sighing heavily. I'm not sure I can manage anymore. I'm exhausted. I stared at her, shocked for a moment that she even felt she had to say such a thing. Oh sweetheart, it will be a dream just to hold you through the night. Your company, just being here with you, is everything. Amory's big eyes grew even wider, then she began to undress with a coy smile playing on her lips. So, you used to dream about me. My mouth went dry as Amory's sweater hit the ground. She began to peel off the rest of her clothing, revealing glorious curves and beautiful skin. Then she began to shiver. Oh sorry you're cold. I rushed to turn on the hot water. She shivered and wrapped her arms around her body while she waited. It's such a weird feeling. Hot steam began to rise inside the room, and it took me a moment to adjust the water to the right temperature, then I gave Amory a little shove. Go on. Get in before you turn blue. She nodded, her teeth chattering together. Thanks. She stepped beneath the water then screeched and jumped out. That's too hot. I checked again with my hand. Weird. It feels just warm to me, but let's adjust it. I turned the temperature down again. Amory scooted back in, then sighed, turning around so the water cascaded down her back. Everything feels so different here. More acute. Intense? I offered. Yes, she said, wetting her hair and picking up the soap. Do you feel it too? I nodded. I do. When Amory finished showering her beautiful body, I handed her a towel so that she could get warm and wrapped up. I jumped in the shower and got to experience firsthand exactly what she was talking about. The water was too hot and the spray prickled on my skin with an unfamiliar sort of pain sensation. Intense is right. When I was done with my shower, I dried off quickly and walked back into the bedroom. I stopped short and stared, entranced by the vision before me. Amory had crawled into the large bed and was sitting up against the headboard, the blankets pulled up to cover her breasts. Her skin glowed in the soft light of the room, 
making me want to reach out and touch her. May I join you? I asked. She nodded and reached out to flip back the blankets. Please. I hurried to join her, throwing off the towels without a care to slide under the warm blankets. Amory came straight into my arms putting her head on my chest and heaved a great sigh. I couldn't help but chuckle. That sigh was a bit much, beautiful girl. Do you carry the weight of the world on your shoulders? She nuzzled in closer. No. Not at all. I just... I waited, but she didn't continue. What is it? I prompted and kissed the top of her head. I just can't believe we're really here. Only last night I was lying in my bed, terrified and alone. And now I'm here with you, on Earth. I ran my hand down the length of her hair slowly. I still can't believe I'm allowed to touch you like this. No one's going to stop me or threaten to break us up ever again. A long silence fell between us, but it was comfortable. Finally, I had to ask. You never told me why you changed your mind in the end. What do you mean, she asked, her hand roaming absently over my chest. I mean, they moved you, didn't they? Or at least tried to. Did you come back? Or did you refuse to go? She lifted her head and shuffled back a little so she could look up at me. They came for me while I was packing and getting ready to go, and? And what? I asked, my gaze dropping to her gorgeous full lips. And I couldn't do it. The idea of leaving you, the thought of never seeing you again. She inhaled sharply. It hurt so much I could barely breathe. And that's when I knew. So I ran. Knew what? I whispered, rolling onto my side so I could face her. That I couldn't live without you, either, she whispered back. I kissed her softly. Not with the sort of passion that would lead to more, but slowly and reverently. It was a kiss of gratitude, appreciation, and comfort. She felt like home. When I finally pulled back, I managed to say, I love you. And I love you, she echoed. She smiled, her expression awash with peace, and rolled over. Will you cuddle me while I sleep, my valentine? I snuggled into place behind her, moaning softly as pleasure swept over me like a cool breeze on a warm day. My arm wrapped around her belly, as her ass nestled perfectly against my thighs. Always, I whispered into her ear, and forever. She sighed and settled into the pillows. I couldn't believe it. We were together, and no one could break us apart. Never again. We'd found our very own happily ever after, on my namesake day. As Amory drifted off to sleep, I held her just listening to the sound of her breathing and smiled. Happy Valentine's Day, my love, I whispered, before I closed my eyes and fell into a dreamless slumber. I didn't need to dream anymore, my dreams had finally come true, and we were living them, together. Epilogue Amory Five years later Val Can you come get the plates for me, please? I called out into the house as I juggled the baby on my hip, shifting her so that I could carry her properly. Sorry beautiful, Val said apologetically, running into the kitchen to grab the plates from the counter. Are you okay with that? he asked, dropping a quick kiss on my cheek. I had a pitcher of lemonade in my other hand, and the music from our 4th of July party was thumping loud and hard in the backyard. Yeah, I am. Let's do this. I followed Val through the back door and set the jug carefully on the trestle table we had set up outside just for this occasion. It was a beautiful day and the weather perfect for a celebration. Our baby started to cry, having lost her pacifier. Oh sweetie, I soothed in hushed tones. It's okay. We'll find it, I promised as I started to look left and right. A man popped up from behind me, his characteristic long white hair pulled back into a low man bun. Looking for this by any chance? he asked. He had my little one's pacifier in his hand. Oh you came. I reached out an arm to Saint Nick, Santa Claus in the flesh, and hugged him as best I could with my precious load. I was hoping you would be able to make it. Nikki grinned at me. I'm happy to be here, Amory. JD had to go back to Salem for a family event, so I thought I'd take the opportunity to drop in and see you guys. 
After all, I haven't met this gorgeous little cherub yet. Nikki held out his finger to my daughter to play with. She grabbed hold of it with her chubby fist, momentarily enthralled by our old friend. How do you do? Santa asked, introducing himself with formal flair, a twinkle in his eyes. This is Julie, I offered, hoisting my little one up higher on my hip once more. She was just six months old and getting heavier by the day. Hello, Julie, he said, returning the pacifier to her. I smiled at my dear friend, who was aging just as I was, he because he'd found his fated love and started a family, and me, well, for the very same reason. Thanks so much for coming. It's my pleasure. I wanted to talk to you anyway, Nikki said in a more serious tone. What about? I asked, concern leaping instantly to the forefront of my mind. Human life was certainly fraught with more challenges and dangers than angelic and immortal life. Anything could have happened. Is something wrong? With JD? Or Sammy? Sammy was their adorable, blue-eyed, red-haired four-year-old son. The future Santa Claus and the perfect blend of both his incredible parents. No, nothing like that, Nikki assured me. We're all fine. I just wanted to take a moment to thank you. Thank me. I asked with a perplexed frown. I couldn't think of anything I'd done for the Klauses lately. Last time we were here, Val happened to let it slip that he'd had a hand in getting JD and I together. Oh. Yes. But it wasn't in the usual way. Did he tell you that? I rushed to reassure my friend and back my husband. There were no Cupid arrows involved or anything like that. It was all entirely natural. It was just a little push in the right direction was all. He smiled as we stood together, staring out at the crowd of people in my backyard. Friends from work as well as our neighbors, all gathered to celebrate the holidays with good cheer and high spirits. Val wasn't too far off. He had our three-year-old son sitting on his shoulders and was happily chatting away with one of the other fathers from our street. Nikki chuckled. He did tell me that, so there's no worries there, Amory. But Val also said that my love match wasn't on the celestial cards. He informed me that you had a hand in all this, too. It was apparently your insistence that pushed him to help me find JD. I shrugged, heat flushing my cheeks. Yeah, well, you're welcome, Nikki. You're Santa, after all. All you do is bring joy to everyone else. You deserve to be happy, too. As do you. Nicky countered, nudging me with his elbow in a playful manner. Humanity suits you, you know? You make it look good. I laughed. Yeah, paying bills, grocery shopping, and a stream of never-ending diapers. Not to mention aging every day. It's totally glamorous. Nicky's blue eyes twinkled with that characteristic Santa Claus humor. You love it, don't you? Yes, I do. I admitted with a grin as I bounced my daughter on my hip, just enjoying the happy scene before us. The last five years since we'd chosen to fall together and become human had been more amazing than I'd ever even dreamed they could be. Val and I loved each other passionately and enjoyed each other every day. That much hasn't changed since we were cupids. I mused with love up glee. Our children were by far our greatest blessing, and our home was always filled with the heartwarming sound of laughter and shrieks of fun. I heard along the grapevine that you haven't given up all of your cupid ways, Nikki said from beside me with a conspiratorial smile. What are you talking about? I asked innocently, glancing at him sidelong. He waggled his eyebrows at me. Made any matches lately? Laughter bubbled out of me, and my soul sang. Well, maybe one or two, I admitted. But matchmaking is fun. And besides, it's kind of my job now. I'd started an online agency, matching up couples with similar interests and desires. It was thriving and fulfilled my cupid heart. Val had finished his conversation with our neighbor and was wandering toward us. So, are you two coming to eat? Or are you going to stand around chatting the day away? I nodded, glancing over at our groaning and heavily laden banquet tables, filled to overflowing with every sort of beloved American treat. A sigh escaped me. This suburban dream was ours. 
Some days I still couldn't believe it and pinched myself, expecting to wake up in my room in heaven. Let's go, my love, said Val, putting his arm around me. And not for the first time, I thanked the heavens for giving me the courage to fall with him that day, incidentally the day of love itself, Valentine's Day. It had been the single most terrifying, thrilling, and defining moment of our lives. And I didn't regret it. Not one single bit. We'd taken control of our own fates. Love truly does conquer all, I thought, remembering the age-old Cupid creed. As though feeling my love for him, Valentine turned to me and slid his arm around my waist with a broad smile. I love you, Amory. And I love you, I whispered, leaning into him. Thank you for our amazing life. You don't have to thank me, beautiful, he answered. We made this happen, together. We had a single moment of pure bliss, just the four of us in each other's arms, our own little family, before the outside world interrupted us once again with its festivities. But I'd meant what I said. I was more grateful to my Valentine than he could ever know. He had made me strong and he'd helped me find my courage. His love had changed me for the better, and thanks to him I had two beautiful little cherubs who made my heart whole in a way nothing else ever would. Heaven really is a place on earth. The End